again here on YouTube. Um, if you've caught any of our other series, let me know. We got a plane going overhead. Let me know if that's something you know that you're that you're enjoying. Let me know that. Uh, you can also hit subscribe uh, on our YouTube channel to make sure you don't miss any notifications for when we do these lives or when we post new videos. Um, I know we've got some great videos that are going to get posted up here soon. And I wanted to show you, I wanted to start off with, um, got a lot of amazing flowers. Uh, this whole series has been addressing one of the most popular questions I get all the time, and that is, what should I grow? And a lot of times, especially this time of year, the first waves of solution, sunflowers and zinnias and different crops like that, if you're a flower farmer or if you're a gardener, have kind of peaked out. And if you succession planted, you might be in between or you might pur purposely have been waiting for another wave of blooms to come later this month when the whole flower world is a lot busier. But you have a need to continue to grow a few things. And so I wanted to show you some of the other flowers out there that might be worth growing or considering to grow. I want to start off by showing you. Last week we covered like some sedum, caryopteris, um, agastache, celosias. Uh, I think I said caryopteris and sedum. Yeah. And so this is an arrangement that was made from those flowers last week. And you can see it still looks pretty doggone good. No, it's not perfect, but the caryopteris, a couple of times have started to fade. The agastache looks good. The celosia looks good. The celosia looks good. I mean, the sedum looks good. Um, and so, yeah, it's time. But these flowers were almost a week old when I pulled them for showing you guys last week. So this is, most of this product is two weeks old. This is one of the benefits of buying local product is you get the super, super fresh product all the time. Um, I'll probably toss those today, not because I need to, maybe I'll dry the celosia because that would be kind of fun to have dried. And I might try to save some seed from the agastache. But overall, it's still holding up great. But today, I have a whole range of new flowers to show you. And I want to also sprinkle in some tips uh, about certain flowers, like zinnias, and bunching, and what to look for, what not to look for. So I want to share this big, this big plant first. This. Another plane going over here. I guess we're in the runway zone today. So this huge bunch of flowers, I love this little, this little lavender bell-shaped bloom. And if you have any questions and you want to type them in the comments, feel free. But I, I love this for two reasons. One, I, I love this little flower. I think it is super special. It is a really pale, pale, pale lavender. You can see some of the, I think this bloom, well, you probably can't see it. This bloom just opened up. Um, this is known by Apples of Peru, is its most common name, and a lot of people know it. You'll see these little bell shaped, almost reminds you of Japanese lanterns, but these little green bells and this is actually, there's a fruit inside here, or a berry that forms inside here. And a lot of times, in fact, here, I can pick one of them. Here, I'll pick one right here. They start drying down at the base, and this is what they do. I'll open it and show you. But this is only three stems. And if you ever watch one of my pokeweed videos, it kind of grows very similar to pokeweed, where it's very branchy. And what I literally do is, because of the way there's a fork in uh, the stems, and some of these these leaves have turned a little bit yellow, so I'm gonna pull them off, uh, because we don't want our customers to have that. But they kind of fork here down low, which allows you to take one stem and kind of fit it into that fork when you're bunching. And, and three stems later, you have a gigantic bunch. It has lots of laterals, so if your customers wanna cut all this up and use it shorter, they could. But I love the lavender flower. I also love this green lantern look. So this is Apples of Peru. It's botanical name is 
Nicandra Faisalo. I, I'm not gonna even try. Um, but this is what it's most commonly known as. Now I wanted to show you, so this will dry like this. And some people like to work with this dried. When you open it up, you'll see this little berry. And I've seen different opinions on this that this may or may not be edible. But I will tell you now that it's in the nightshade family. So, you know, like eggplants and things like that. So, I am I mean, it's probably okay, but I'm not gonna recommend it. I just feel like it's just kind of a cool thing to have and it's something different in the garden or, cause it gets big. It can get to be, um, gosh, I think I read somewhere it can get to be like five feet tall or more and it gets this huge canopy on it. So it's really great. Now, one of the tips I wanted to kind of show you guys is with zinnias and, or zinnias, depending on how you pronounce it. Now, I, you know, we have a lot of the big binaries, but this is Oklahoma, and I may have showed this before, but I wanted to show it again. Um, this, it, it, to me, this is like the ranunculus of the summer. It's not as big and fluffy as the, the binary series, but it does get a beautiful, I mean, look at how those petals just stack. I just, I just think that this is what could or should be used um, in place of ranunculus. There is a cream or white that tends to kind of be ivory, excuse me. And there's a, like a butter color. There is a pink, I think this is the salmon. But this is really, really great. And I, uh, let me see, one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. So this bunch had 11 stems in it, which I think is a great idea um, because zinnias sometimes do this with bent necks and that happens just in the delivery or shipping. I think it's a good idea to put an extra stem or two in. There are smaller. It makes the bunch seem bigger, adding value, and it gives you a couple extras in case something gets broken. So that is uh, Oklahoma zinnias. And then I wanted to show, now, my favorite color zinnias have always been green, but green and white zinnias are challenging because the bugs get into them and everything else. And I wanted to show this. These uh, were cut last weekend, so they're a week old, but that's not, I kind of wanted to show you, uh, and so some of these have some dings on them, so don't get look too close. But that is an amazing green zinnia. Um, it was prettier when we first cut it. But what I wanted to show you is when you're bunching zinnias for your, your clients, some of these guys need to be called out. Um, uh, this little one's not too bad. This is way too little and you can see how the center is spent. So this is not something I would include in a bunch. Um, and these are kind of like singles. And honestly, if you put these in bunches, it kind of makes the good ones not look so good. And a lot of times people won't buy them just because of the three or four perfect ones because they see all this. And even though they may, they may look, and I know these are a little past their peak, but they may have looked great. There's still these singles and I just feel like that's not really, not really wonderful. So I've showed some Rebecca's over the past few weeks, or these several lives we've done, but I haven't shown you this one yet. And I, this is, I think, by far the best. This is Henry Otters, and this Rebecca pretty much stays as sort of star-shaped, and I think this one is the best for a couple reasons. One, it's super tall. I mean, super tall. Like this has been cut down. I think this is about, well, this is well over three feet and it's been cut down. It was actually taller in the field. And each stem, let me pull one apart. Oh, the butterflies are liking some of these. Um, you can see that each stem has a lot of different breaks on them. And I feel like that adds a lot of value to it. Plus it's very whimsy. The flowers sort of dance. And I think that's, um, a great feature when looking for flowers. Also, the other Rebecca's tend to show a lot of bug damage. They, they tend to show uh, bruising, like in shipping and delivery. But these guys, they just hold up. They're so strong, so resilient. Um, and I feel like because they have 
these sort of star-shaped petals uh, or pattern in their petals. I feel like it's not quite as bold of a yellow. If you're really not into yellow, but you're trying to bring in some of this look, this kind of a summery look. So this is Rebecca Henry Eiler, and uh, this was, uh, I think, grown from plugs. I do know that this is a second year plant. She got cuttings off, she got cut flowers off of it last year, and then got some amazing flowers on it this year. It's just started, the patch is packed and full. So even though you may pay a little more for a plug, but if you're in an area where they rebloom really well, you're gonna get that back year after year after year. And so this is one of my favorite Rebecca's. And I just, I had to show it um, because it's early on in the season. And when you're planning for next year, this is one I would incorporate. Also, if you're doing bouquet work, sometimes the other Rebecca's are um, not as prolific or have as high bud count per stem. So can you imagine that in a bouquet? If you're doing like farmer's markets or just you know, like a farm stand or maybe you have a CSA, this gives this one stem gives you a lot of volume as a filler, as a color, and I just think it's it's great. So this is Henry Eilers and it's definitely worth worth everything there is about it. So um, I have so much more to show you guys. Now this is a flower that's a little bit more challenging. This is known as Jewels of Opar. Now, I did, or Telenium is its botanical name. I don't know if you guys can see it real well because it is just these stems just covered. This is after the flowers have already bloomed and spent and they almost have like these little seed pods on them. And this, they will come off if you cut them too late. But this is about a 15 stem bunch. And that's the one thing I will say about this. I think it's a cool filler. I think it's a cool texture. I would never plant a ton of it because I just don't know if it shows up super well in design work. But texturally, I think it's great. Put a lot of stems in a bunch because you want it to kind of feel like you're getting a good value. Here's two bunches. Um, and the farmer brought these into us and they weren't bunched. And so I bought, I bought them for this and I, and I was like, oh, let me show kind of how to do this. These bunches are a mixture of big and little stems. Now I put a rubber band, I put two on them. I put one down below, which I can show you how to do that. If you're rubber banding, I usually like will go up into the bunch, grab a few stems, go around and then go back up into the bunch again. I was nervous about having this be really wide and open because when people go to pull on it, like as a solid bunch, I was afraid it'd come apart um, or it'd get messy. So I put a second rubber band on it and I put it, I didn't go up all the way because I wanted it to seem full. If you go up too high, a lot of times I've seen growers rubber bands up way too high and it ends up really making the bunches look tight and compact and not as big and fluffy. And to me, if it's big and fluffy, it looks bigger and it, it seems like it's worth what you're charging for it. So anyway, this is Jewel of Opar and the foliage is real compact and low for the most part. Once you get it entrenched, it, it can be very, very aggressive. Not aggressive, well, some people say aggressive, um, but it, it, is a, it is a good perennial. All right, let me dab my forehead a little bit here. It's very humid with all the rain we've had. Okay, so this last bucket that I have has a ton of stuff in it. And I'm really excited to show you this. When I was in Boston last year, I was at the Arnold Arboretum, and this is a flower that has been imported a lot. Now, one thing I, I don't really talk about too much is that everything you're seeing here was grown here in the U.S. Uh, or, uh, yeah, everything here has been grown in the U.S. And a lot of it has been grown here locally, here in Nashville. But then a lot of it came from the West Coast. Uh, this came from Oregon. And this is Sangosorbia. And it, um, it has a common name, which I didn't know, a great burnet. And this is a flower that designers really do love because in bouquet work or in design work it just this little pop of burgundy a lot of times helps pull colors together and it's really great um 
I saw it growing in LA and it was very prolific. Here's one stem and this is a great cut stage. It could be cut a little bit more open, but this flower here, this guy right here, uh, what happened is as the other flowers open, it starts to fade and sometimes that's a, that's a problem. So you don't want to let it get too open. But now this is again like a 15 stem bunch. These flowers that are very very whimsy and airy. Um, in order to kind of make sure your customers feel like they have a great value, if you sell to florists or wholesalers, or uh, maybe you just sell it by the bunch at a, at a market, or maybe you design with it. it anyway, the, the bunch is it's so important because this, being 15 stems, it looks so much fuller. If I were to take five stems of this away, let's see if I can do that without making too big of a mess. Okay, so that's four, here's five. So you can see the bunch is a whole lot thinner. Putting these five stems with it really makes it kind of pop and add some value to it. So this is Sangasorbia and it is definitely a great flower if you sell to florists um, and being that it can be perennialized in certain climates, um, it'll just keep keep coming back and the nice thing is this time of year when it's really blooming in a lot of places um, it is uh, perfect because we just want that little bit of burgundy in our summer designs so that is Sangasorbia and it's pretty awesome okay, I'm gonna put it in this bucket over here now this is a flower that starts blooming. This is a favorite of mine too. This is Eucomus. And a lot of people, when they see this at first, they think, oh, that's Aramaris. And it's not Aramaris. Uh, Eucomus or pineapple lily. Notice how, let me show you this bloom right here. This is a great example. See how this top on it kind of reminds you of a pineapple top? And this flower so this is this is a it comes this is kind of a, what they call purple it's not really purple but it is it does have some purple in it and it comes in a white and it comes in a pink and then it comes in some mixed variations of it but eucomus is great for that line flower if you want a line flower uh much like uh, Aramaris, but Aramaris season's over. Over Now, you may know Aramaris by foxtail lily. Some people know that the big yellow, peach, white, spiky flowers. Um, but this is Eucomus. And again, it's another perennial. Um, these came from Oregon. I know they've been grown in Northern California. So probably hardier in climates that don't get quite so cold for so long. But, uh, so you might want to make sure you read about it and see if it's appropriate for your zone. But uh, Eucomus is another great flower. I mean, imagine a bouquet of this in a market or in, or using it in your designs. It's a wow flower because a lot of people have never seen it. They've never seen Eucomus and it continues to open up. Some of these lower flowers start to kind of fade, like just like an Aramaris, but it continues to open up and just get fabulous. It's not fragrant. I don't really... Maybe a real faint smell, but it's not very fragrant, but it's a big wow flower. All right, so last but not least, with summer coming to an end, well, that's not really true. With some, being in the middle of summer and everything uh, kind of changing gears a little bit, grasses are a huge flower uh, that is used in design work and in bouquets, selling them by the bunch. Uh, and they're fairly easy to grow for the most part, but sometimes people wonder which ones to grow because you don't want to sit here and devote a lot of attention and hard-earned time and then have it not really pay off for you. So I want to—I have three different ones here. This is probably one of the more popular ones. Uh, this is explosion grass. This is a bunch. Um, I'm going to break this down for you just a little bit. If you have any questions, feel free to put them down in the box and it should come up so I can see them. But I will say that um, if you like what we're doing here, be sure to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel because 
I'm trying to provide some great content that will help you decide what to grow, how to pick what to grow, um, pros and cons of some of it. Now, this explosion grass has, gosh, probably 20 stems to it. Now, with a lot of grasses, you can't do like a 10 stem bunch because it just doesn't give you that sense of value. It doesn't really um, show you kind of I don't know. It doesn't, it doesn't give you that wow factor that just makes, it makes people think about it. Because you know what, when you go to charge for it, you, you want them to not think too much because you want to think, oh wow, the value is really there and they are going to just grab it. So this, like I said, is about 20 stems. Let me show you so you can see one stem right there. Kind of comes up, kind of looks like a stalk of corn almost. And then there's this explosion, I don't know if you can see it, explosion of sort of like a filament that is like a grass. And here's, hey, here's a better one. And when you're using this in work, I think sometimes I would probably just cut off this, cut off those two leaves and look at that in a bouquet and design work and a boot, as a boutonniere, wouldn't that be kind of cool? It reminds you of fireworks, and, you know, explosion, right? But look at this, this it all together it's just a great size bunch. If I were to split this, you can see, oh, this one looks a little bigger. So here, we'll split that, try to split it even. It is, it's still okay, but you might sit back and you might hesitate um, by giving the two, it, it's, it's easy to grow and it's very prolific. Now I will say that once, here's a look at this dog. You can see this stalk, it's way more developed and it's really hard to see on camera, but there is little black, almost like seed heads on it now, which adds a little bit more depth. Anyway, it's, it's just a great grass. Explosion grass, something I would definitely consider growing. Um, I know that with a lot of grasses, we kind of had a meadow when, when we were growing um, and we would cut different grasses out of that area because they were just great additions. Now, one grass that we do see a lot of is bunny tail grass, rabbit tail grass. Um, I've heard even rabbit's foot grass because it has that sort of soft feel to it. And it is, uh, you can dry it. Explosion grass would be hard to dry. This dries well. Um, and I've seen it uh, in, a, in a lot of different sizes and formats. There's different varieties. Some of them have smaller sort of plumes on them. Uh, which I tend to like better than some of these bigger ones. But I think in most design work, this will show up better. If you're mixing them with bouquets, again, this will show up better. And you can see um, one, two, three, four, five, like that's about a, again, about a 18 stem bunch. And again, that just adds more value to it. Um, again, this is another product that because of in shipping, depending on how you ship it, it can break easily so it's nice to have some extra stems in there but I feel like this is very popular with florists and uh, the next one the last one last but not least is this is what they call red fountain grass and it has kind of a burgundy purpley tone to it but probably out of all the grasses that we sell this is the number one grass that we get asked for, um, especially later in the season because everybody wants a grass because it sort of just feels like late summer, fall. Um, the color is really nice. It contrasts with a lot of blooms. Here, here's some, um, here's uh, some more Oklahoma zinnias. Uh, you can see it, it really kind of goes with almost anything. That's sort of the salmon color. Um, here's a stem of Henry Eilers. Again, it, it just kind of goes with anything and everything. I was gonna see, um, here is uh, some red celosia, and you can see with the red, again, it goes with everything. So fountain grass, I like number one, because it's got a longer plume to it than bunny tail. It also um, has this arch to it, which conveys a lot of motion, which that movement um, is really pretty, again, in design work, whether it's centerpieces, whether it's bouquets, 
Uh, it just, it's something that wedding people really like. I know last year, I think we had one order for like 45 bunches of this. It was a big event and a lot of people, uh, and this one person had sold it and it was in everything they did. So it's definitely worth checking out. And, um, but yeah, so that is fountain grass. So I wanted to highlight that. Also, um, we have a very special episode coming up this week. Um, I don't want to tell you who it is yet, but if you're not subscribing to the Flower Podcast on a podcast app yet, really would recommend it because that way you won't miss any episodes. They just automatically will feed to your Spotify or Apple Podcast account um, or any of the accounts that you might have or you listen to podcasts on. And uh, also, I'd recommend if you haven't uh joined our email family please do and subscribe to our youtube channel uh and share it if there's somebody you think would love to know what to grow um we've been i think this is our ninth episode of this we've done every saturday and it's been great to highlight flowers showing you the pros and cons of some of them and see if they fit for where you're growing and what you're doing so uh, anyway it's been great joining you guys i hope you guys have a great uh, day and try some of these amazing flowers next year on the farm. Thanks. Bye.